10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Prudiger had won many architectural awards, but the housing authorities decided to demolish it. Socially, it had been a disaster. In many ways, the Pruitt-Igo development was a symbol of the modern movement's solution to the housing question. From the start of the 20th century, it was the insistence that architecture could solve social problems which set apart the modern movement from its antecedents. We no longer feel ourselves to be the men of the cathedral, palaces and podia. We must invent and rebuild the modern city like an immense and tumultuous building site. Flexible, mobile and dynamic in its every part. And the modern house like a gigantic machine. Building is the immediate bearer of spiritual strength, the creator of a sense of totality which today slumbers and tomorrow will awaken. Here, the forces of geometry play a fugal symphony. The fast-moving car travels along the raised motorway. A majestic avenue of skyscrapers seems to multiply in space. Between them is not the meager crack of light you see in a distressing city like New York, but a vast space. Here stands the city, full of people, in the pure, still air. And the noise is quelled beneath the foliage. It's now fashionable to single out Le Corbusier and blame him for the failings of modern architecture. This, of course, is not wholly fair, but it was Le Corbusier who most accurately predicted the form which the new housing was to take. None of his famous city visions were realized at the time, but they did contain the seeds of the future. It's only in the years since the Second World War that the ideas of modern architecture have really begun to alter our lives radically. In the early 50s, the LCC Architects Department was divided on how to develop this site. The Corbusian faction won. Walton West became famous as an exemplar of modern architecture, and its ideology has remained unchallenged until very recently. In this film made in 1966, with a commentary by Professor Patrick Nutchins, two of the architects involved in building Walton West the late Bill Howell and J.A. Partridge, talk about their work there. I think it's fascinating to recall that in the early 1950s there was a site in southwest London with four houses on it and of 150 acres. The LCC bought two of these houses and part of the site of the other two, giving themselves 100 acres. By any standards, this was a magnificent site with a mile frontage facing on Richmond Park and looking south over it for miles across 18th century landscaping. Since the early teachings of Corbusier, architects have talked a lot about the need for open space in relation to high buildings, the need for the people to emerge out into grassed areas 
and for the buildings to breathe themselves. We were conscious that this open space should be a more sophisticated space with the uh, grass flowing out of it between and under the blocks rather than the way that the sea flows under Brighton Pier and out the other side. There were two types of high buildings and these we usually refer to as point blocks and slab blocks. Perhaps I ought to explain what those terms mean. The point blocks are these ones here and they're called point blocks because they occupy a point on the ground. They are fairly small when seen from on top. And this, this was very convenient because we could place them about amongst the trees, just like putting a lot of ornaments about on a mantelpiece. The slab blocks are what the name suggests. They're large slabs of building, just like a cornflakes packet rested on its side, so that they're fairly long, fairly high, and fairly thin. Now, much of the character of the point blocks and of the slab blocks results from the carefully thought out punctuation and the contrast between pattern and plane surfaces. And there's a lot more to this surface organization than you might think at first. Looking at first, you might think this is simply bits of concrete. Well, it's not. To be precise, this is a concrete made up of Dorset shingle and Derby spar. It's molded into prefabricated panels, which are known as cladding blocks. And these blocks are hoisted by crane and held in place between the horizontal members at the top and at the bottom of the picture which is coming on now. The horizontals mark the floor and the ceiling levels of the flats inside. You can see how these units form a rhythmic pattern on the facade. The dimensions of the window openings and so on are permutations of the panel dimensions. And the only thing here that needs regular maintenance is the window frames. In its time, Alton West, like the wards, it still stands while Pruitt-Igoe was destroyed. But there have, nevertheless, been some social problems which have expressed themselves in violence and vandalism. Can we blame the architects for the social problems? It's certainly fashionable to do so at the moment. But too critical a view of the role of architecture will ignore the contribution of socio-economic factors to the problem. Whatever the success or failure of Roehampton, we have to acknowledge the contribution of an exceptional side. The landscape provides an ideal setting for an English version of Le Corbusier's vertical garden city. But what happens when you apply these architectural principles to less Elysian settings? On this site in North Kensington, there is no parkland, and little open space. But Trellick Tower too has a very sculptural form. Its architect was Erno Goldfinger. Everything one does must look good ultimately. That's nobody's business but mine, that it should look good. That's why I'm doing it for. For me, architecture is like solving a mathematical problem, and that's why I appreciate, I mean, it's, it's magnificent. The brief which is given by the JLC is magnificent. And, uh, complete and precise, and then one can, of course, alter it slightly, if, if needed. Goldfinger's Trellick Tower is magnificent sculpture. It is pattern-making in the grand manner, a potent symbol of modernism. Barlow is on the top, and uh, the circulation is uh, by means of pumps. Then we have the lift motor room is on top. L at various levels there are tank rooms and pump rooms for firefighting and for also for distribution of water. All the water has to be pumped. Now all this is isolated from the dwellings. There are bridges which connect this service tower to the dwelling core. These bridges uh, sit on rubber pads and there's no sound transmission from one to the other. Goldfinger has employed fine materials. The concrete has been given a special finish with a pneumatic gun, which gives an extremely rough surface, which is not only resistant to graffiti, but has a rich texture too. Inside the building, there is plenty of use made of marble and hard woods while details like the doors leading onto the access galleries are carefully designed to give an effect of crossing a threshold into a semi-private domain. 
they had a wonderful plant who, when it was a little bit more expensive to use good materials, he let me use good materials because it will save them endless trouble right on. But what can one do when somebody breaks a, a window? The Jersey gave us a perfect brief, a very complete brief. The old people's club room was included. We have also included playrooms for children in the service tower, which are not used now because of vandalism. And we, because there's no organization, they haven't managed to have an organization who can may, be made responsible for these things. The flats themselves are of an exceptionally high standard. Each flat has a wide frontage with a balcony. And residents have plenty of room to eat out in true international style. This is a typical two-bedroom flat. Uh, one of the very important things in this development is this complete pedestrian precinct, first of all, and that we have different size buildings, and every building has a, has a character of its own. You come into the hall, and you know where you go, and I deprecate the re repetition of tower blocks all the same. If you come home drunk, you don't know where to go. Not only have you, uh, have you got to escape the breathalyzer's test, but on the top of it, when you, you can't find your, your front door. Now, that's a great English tradition, of course, that the houses in the street are all the same. When you go into the house, it's all different. All the houses are different from each other. That's a great English tradition. Because the old, the, I mean, the hundreds and hundreds of houses are all the same. Now, despite Goldfinger's enthusiasm, the high-rise solution to the housing problem is facing increasing hostility. When Le Corbusier asked his famous question, architecture or revolution, it was answered, of course, by architecture. Now Oscar Newman, an American architect academic, has been asking, architecture or crime? When masses of people are herded together in an anonymous and impersonal block by an architect who cares not first of all for them, but for the magnificently sculptural forms he is erecting, then respect for property disappears. Newman argues that the failure of modern movement housing is because of its lack of individuality and absence of semi-private areas, or what he calls defensible space, the title of his book. Effectively, what Newman is saying is that he wants a return to vernacular architecture. I definitely think there is a future to, for high-rise buildings. One didn't wait for Oscar Newman to make defensible space. I, all, all, of course, one locks one's front door is defensible space. I mean, this is ludicrous, this whole, this Oscar, Oscar, what's his name, it's Newman's. It's not a new idea. Defensible space, I think this, this style of architecture started sometimes in the... 1850s and it's going to go on for the another 50 or 100 years. The Renaissance lasted 500 years. Why, why shouldn't the rationalist architecture of the eight, 1850s, no, don't, not 19, 1850s, not last an, another 500 years? This is a rationalist architecture. Vernacular, this is vernacular. This is the vernacular style. The vernacular international style. The, like, international style, like, like Gothic or Renaissance, or Baroque. Trellick Tower and Roehampton are both recognisable as striking examples of modern architecture. In the next housing scheme, we will see something quite different. The architects Ralph Erskine, Vernon Gracie and Associates are creating housing on a massive scale, but retaining the qualities of identity, individuality and charm which people find agreeable. The first view you get of Mica is this tough, fortress-like wall of flats, relieved by bold patterns in coloured brick.
there are small windows with brightly painted ventilators. The wall, or perimeter block, is designed to protect the development from the noise of a motorway which is intended to pass close by. The small soundproofed windows light only bathrooms and kitchens. The profile is dramatically crowned with blue wedge-shaped housings for the lift machinery. The brick patterning intensifies around the entrances and brightly coloured porte cochere provide shelter. The other side of the wall is quite different. The perimeter block opens out with cantilevered balconies and access galleries facing the sunny southwest. Concrete beams support light timber superstructures, glazed in in part, and roofed with corrugated plastic. Access galleries join up with wider areas where they meet the lifts and stairs. These areas are provided with flower beds and seats and form a sort of suspended conservatory where plants and residents can enjoy the sunshine protected from the wind. The rough sawn timber surfaces are treated with bright coloured wood preservative. The whole structure is put together in a seemingly informal way. From here you get a view across the roofs of Old Biker, yet to be demolished or you can turn left down the access balcony and notice how the flats have step-up front doors, benches below the living room windows and their own flower tubs. The balconies become suspended garden walks which lead you around the curving path of the wall. Only a small proportion of the accommodation in the perimeter block is family maisonettes. You can see them occupying the ground and first floors. They are faced in brick and set out like terrace houses with front gardens. Each is provided with a bench seat and a coloured plastic porch. But the perimeter block, with its specific function of shielding Biker from the noise of a proposed new motorway, is only part of the redevelopment area. As well as being a symbol, it acts like a medieval defensive wall protecting Biker from the outside world. The perimeter block is the only thing approaching high-rise in Biker, where the architects have tried to keep everything else as low as possible. Quite different in scale from the perimeter block, the low-rise development is nevertheless consistent in its philosophy. Surrounded by the wall, it looks like a fairly densely packed labyrinth. The houses are built around traffic-free zones. Here again, we find buffers of semi-private space between the public and private. There are several degrees of privacy, in the foreground, the public path runs across the terrace where it meets this area. There is a table and bench protected by a brick flower bed and a tree. There is no reason to stop the public sitting down here, as indeed we did, but a stranger does feel overlooked. Beyond this is a low garden gate leading to the semi-private access to the houses. 
In here, you feel uncomfortable if not on business. To emphasize the communal nature of this space, there is a room on the right of the tree, the one with the red door, which tenants can use as a hobby's room and potting shed. Again, there is a variety of materials and a sort of ad hoc rusticity, which increases the private and intimate character of the buildings and spaces. We asked the architect, Vernon Gracie, if his use of timber was at all unconventional. Well, I would have termed wood a pretty conventional material. Treated the way we're using it, it should have uh, a lifespan, certainly as long as the structure or fabric of the building. It's uh, a rough sawn finish on the timber, which enables us then to get to use wood preservative colors on the timber and to get good adhesion. If you have a nice smooth surface, then the stuff gets washed off more easily. It has a secondary plus in that uh, a rough sawn finish is darn sight less conducive to incidental vandalism than a smooth one. Uh, you can't write on it quite so easily and you don't rub your hand up it twice. This, if you like, is a reflection of the policy that we adopt. You know, that One wants a new environment to be a soft environment, that you can give it the appearance of being soft, give it the appearance, if you like, almost of being delicate, in need of being cared for. And although it's downsight tougher than it looks, if you can get that sort of attitude into the minds of the tenants, then I think there's a much greater hope of the thing actually working socially. You know, it, it is the other way of trying to counteract vandalism. You know, the, the, the tough concrete, you can't tear this down even if you have a battering ram approach, is one way of doing it. And we know what the social consequences of that can be. Of course, the three estates we've been looking at are solutions to particular problems. Biker may be a success in Newcastle, but what would happen to it in North Kensington? At Biker, the architects were brought in to reappraise a redevelopment of an old working class quarter of obsolete housing. The architect Vernon Gracie explains. We started from the idea of trying to retain a large part of the area and doing a revitalization scheme on it. We very quickly uh, discovered through being in Biker itself um, that the people here, while they had a tremendous attachment to the social um, community feeling of the place, had absolutely no attachment to the physical environment and that they really wanted to see the physical environment replaced rather than modernized. At Biker, it seems that there is a refreshing attempt to involve people as much as possible in the redevelopment process. Of course, that's not to say that the architects didn't have a clear conception of what they were setting out to achieve. Final judgment on the success of Biker will have to wait until 1982, when the whole project is completed. Development will then have settled down, and what is now exciting could possibly by then appear to be embarrassing and silly. But at the moment, it appears that the architects have found precisely that new vernacular which Oscar Newman was looking for. By retaining the cohesion of the old community, the architects are pleased to be able to report that, so far, there is little vandalism at Biker. The lack of uniformity, the sheer expression of colour and form producing such visual interest, make Biker contrast strongly with any other housing estate. Ralph Erskine and Vernon Gracie have not given Newcastle whimsical imitations of cottage styles, but instead, Biker is full of real machines for living in, and the form really follows the function which people have in some way decided for it.